Hi there and welcome to chapter 4.4 .4, where we're going to talk about um, our decimals, exponents, and real numbers. So this section deals with our 6th through 8th grade um, students and we're going to be looking at our decimals as not just an extension of fractions but it just an all a different way of representing our fractions. We use decimals for a variety of different reasons. Sometimes it's easier to do our computation when dealing with decimals and then sometimes it's because we want uh, rounding to do. We're not really concerned about the exact answer. There's not really one standard way of doing our decimals or of representing them. Notice that in the United States we use a point and in continental Europe they use a comma. If you'll notice uh, $43.26 that's a nice easy way to represent that amount if we get to use a decimal. Uh, same thing with a uh, weight, you know, we're looking at what a package weighs or measuring distance uh, instead of saying three and seven tenths of a mile we would just say 3.7. It just makes things easier. Another couple of uh, different examples whenever we're looking at uh, our decimals and different ways that we use them. And in representing our integers as far as what they look like with exponents, you might go ahead and um, notice here that uh, this our negative exponents refer to 1 over. So this would represent 1 over 10 to the third. And so let's look at what that really means, 1 over 10 to the third, that's our negative exponent means 1 over, so this would be 1 over 1, 2, 3, so it's 1 thousandth. And notice here this is the tenths, the hundredths, and the thousandths place. So our decimal system uses this base 10 um, counting numbers in order to represent our numbers in an easier way so we don't have to use those fractions. Here is uh, just another slide that's talking about using the tenths. Let's look at our uh, manipulatives here. If we were going to say that sample of gold weighs 3.6 ounces, how could we use these base 10 blocks to represent this? Well, let's see, if I were going to use this, I probably would use this long to represent uh, a whole. And I would say that I had three whole. And then point 0.6, I would say that that could be represented just like four, five, six, and so if these were tens, I would represent it looking like this. All right. And here we are representing our whole numbers and decimals in expanded form. You'll have to do some expanded form on your homework and uh, notice that we're, it's, it's uh, in this times 10 to the type notation. So if you're asked to do expanded form, then you use this times 10 to the notation. So if it's in the third decimal spot, it will be times 10 to the minus 3. If it was in the fourth decimal spot, it would be times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, this times 10 to the 0 means it's in the ones place because 10 to the 0 is 1, so that 4 is in the ones place. The 2 is in the tens place and notice that the 6 is in the hundreds place, so that's times 10 squared, which is 100. Mm, really good uh, thing that you'll want to think about here, because students do tend to get a little confused on this. Uh, if you have 
point two, adding a zero to the end of point two doesn't change that number at all. So it just means that you have, you could say that you had 20 out of 100. That's what that would mean, 20 hundredths. This would mean 2 out of 10. This reduces down to 1 fifth. This also reduces down to 1 fifth. And I could put two zeros on the end, and this would represent 200 out of a thousand and this is also one-fifth. So there would be my explanation but then I'm talking to adults. You're gonna have to come up with a way to talk to kids and have them make have this make sense. Um, seeing as you talk about fractions first, to me this this would be a, a, a good way to go about it and perhaps you have another method. Um, and that's what teaching is all about, is coming up with alternative ways to explain the same thing because not everyone understands things in the same way. So this is asking your students, when do I need that zero? Now notice if I had the number 2 and I had the number 20, that zero does mean a lot. And if you have 200, that sure means a lot because it's, it means that I'd rather have $200 than $2. But if I start putting a decimal point here, then I still have $2 no matter which way I go because zeros after the decimal point don't matter. This zero is a placeholder to let you know that you have 8 hundredths and not 8 tenths. This zero is just to show that we have zero ones, um, and this is another placeholder zero. This zero at the end isn't really doing anything, and that's another placeholder. All right, this slide is just about restating what we've already talked about, adding a zero after the decimal point doesn't change the value at all. However, adding a zero uh, before the decimal point certainly does. Um, this has to do with how it is that we describe those places in the decimal with the th th thing at the end. This slide talks about uh, changing our fractions into decimals and doing that division and how we perform that operation on the calculator and how we do that is just oh, that pin. So we would just key 1 divided by 2 and we would end up with 0 0.5. Of course we already know what the answer to that is. And then 1 divided by 3, we would get 0 0.3333. And it would carry on. And we might say, oh, I'm going to round that to just 0.33 or something of that sort. Um, many of these, we already know what they look like. Uh, this one would be 0.01. This would be 0 0.001. Uh, this would be 0 0.11 over 50. Now that would require a little bit of thought. We have to go, well, that's one-fifth. Um, so that would be 0 0.02. And just notice that it is double what this one-hundredth is, or double this 0 0.01. We do use fractions whenever we're trying to describe uh, uh, the length of something. Here's a way that we could go, ah, that's like about either a third or a fourth, something of that sort. Uh, it makes it easier when our uh, rulers or whatever it is we're measuring with, they've been divided up into uh, uh, more divisions so that we can get better accuracy on this. And um, here's just an example of that. Another about the precision and if we were if we had a, a good enough ruler we could measure something to a great deal of accuracy. This slide is about uh, getting students to understand the um, this pen. Getting students to understand how to order from smallest to largest and looking at our decimals. Let's see, this is to a third place, so I'm gonna go ahead and carry them out to 
three places each because I can add a zero and not change it at all and it makes it easier when I do this to see which one would be the largest so he would be number one number two and number three if I did oh they want of course they want smallest to largest okay so I'll do it this way <laughs> this was largest to smallest and I will do smallest to largest which we'll is go in backwards order all right so just as I did whenever I uh, was checking to see which one was greater or smaller than the other uh, what I did was I made the uh, place values the same on each one so I would do the same thing again here and I would say oh, I'm not going to add these two I need for it to all go to the same uh, place value and now I can add and you'll want to uh, teach your students that you need to add the same place value numbers to each other and how I do that is line them up according to the decimal point now here's an interesting problem isn't it whenever you're multiplying decimals in and why is it when you multiply decimals that you uh, move your decimal point so here's some manipulatives to help uh, explain that if I have uh, 2.6 times 3.2 this is set up so that okay, grief here we go with the pen again this is set up so that I have 1 2 3 point 2 and then this way I have 1 2 point 6 this way so if I count all that I have when I do that um, for my multiplication all right they're gonna walk us through let's see here pen oh, of course I didn't do that right pen they're gonna walk us through that there are six of these big squares here so this is six and then ten of these so there's six seven eight nine ten so there's another one so that's a six plus one one two three four five six seven eight so here's eight nine ten so there's another one and then there's point two and then these guys are in the hundreds place so I can count there's 12 of those so I can say that that is plus point one two this would give me eight point oops that's not a point eight point three two would be what I would get for multiplying with a manipulative and here they are they're going to walk us through this uh, multiplying with the distinct parts and they're going to add these up for us and you can watch them as they add each of these different pieces up and end up with 8.32 here we are doing it by um, the method that they we're typically shown whenever we uh, do this where you, they tell you to just go ahead and multiply it just as you normally would and then count the numbers behind the decimal points there's one two and then go one two and place your decimal point that's typically the procedure the rule that they tell us to do but the manipulative kind of explains why it works the way it does and we are doing the distributive property whenever we uh, are multiplying and going through this division uh, same sort of thing but with our division what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're multiplying this one by a 10 and this one by a 10 and if I had that them each as say fractions I had 2 4 7 point 9 over 7 point 4 in essence what you're doing is multiplying top and bottom by 10 so that you can get 2, 4, 7, 9 divided by 74 just to make our division with our particular rule that we have much easier to do and this is why it's exactly the same so oh and here they go through that procedure with you 
So exponents uh, is just a fancy way of representing uh, repeated multiplication. Uh, getting the value of 2 to the 24th it would be a pain. Um, I could write out tw 24 of these 2's and then do them one at a time going 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 times 2 is 32 keep going all the way across the rest of the way or I could group them and I could say well this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 groups of uh, so it would be 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 so I could say that this is just 16 to the would we say was 6 of them yes and uh, I could press those buttons in the calculator making it a little bit easier I don't know what kind of calculator they were using here is one of the um, uh, simpler calculators if you're using a TI-84 then you would hit like the uh, 2 and then you hit the carrot top button that you raise it to the button and it would be 24 or you could hit 16 raise it to the 6 and you get the same answer whichever uh, method that you use negative exponents now that's a tricky thing for students uh, to understand just as the anything to the zero power is something tricky for them to understand uh, one of the ways that I do this is I ask them whenever we're first studying exponents is I will say well I get them to tell me what 5 over 5 is because everyone seems to know that that's 1 of course and then I say well if I'm looking at x to the second over x to the second what do I do to exponents when I divide and students will usually say well you subtract and so that would be x to the zero and if this x to the zero represents the same thing over itself this must equal one and so that kinda helps them understand why something to the zero power is one because it represents the same thing over itself what about these negative exponents um, I have students look at those as if I had let's say 5 over 25 that would be the same as saying 5 to the first over 5 squared and what do I do to exponents when I divide that's subtract 1 minus 2 is negative 1 and we could say that this also represents 1 over 5 so 1 over 5 must be equal to 5 to the negative 1 and you can go on with different examples from there to help reassure them of that um, conclusion. So here they are, they're going through and talking to you about that same sort of pattern and looking at the patterns of numbers. I do this with lots of examples and um, you usually do this in a math 055 course and, uh, and it is a basis for what you need to learn how to work with in algebra so we go back over it again so anything to the negative exponent means 1 over um, I say that over and over again to students in a sing-song kind of voice just so that they'll um, kind of sing it to themselves whenever they work these problems I'll say anything to the negative exponent means and then I want them to say 1 over irrational numbers are those numbers that are like um, the square roots of prime uh, irrational numbers are square root of prime numbers they're those numbers that keep on going without any sort of pattern uh, to them so one-third would not be is not irrational because it equals 0.333 and that's a pattern so this is not irrational it is actually a rational number so we wouldn't consider one-third I would consider pi to be an irrational number because he carries on and on without bound without any sort of pattern e is another one of those irrational numbers that you will um, encounter and here they are giving the history of irrational numbers and how 
they came about. So um, square root of 2 was probably the first irrational number that uh, uh, these early mathematicians thought of that and pi. Those two were the probably the first two irrational numbers. When elementary school students start uh, looking at square roots, square roots, you could say that the square root of 81 is a positive 9 or a negative 9 because negative 9 times negative 9 is 81. However, we have defined the square root to be the principal square root, which means just the positive one. So we kind of negated that case by defining our square roots to really represent principal square roots. With the real numbers, that is the set of um, both the rational and irrational numbers. And the rational numbers are all of my fractions, and the irrationals are all of those square roots, primes, pies, whatever in our uh, number lines. So we started with our natural numbers, which started with 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we went to whole numbers. And uh, then we went on from whole numbers to integers, where we added the positive and negative. And here is a kind of like a little diagram of us going from natural numbers, adding in a 0 to make whole numbers, adding in the negative numbers to make integers, and then all of this group make up rational numbers, and then the irrationals are those weirdo crazy numbers. So if we look at the uh, set of irrational numbers to the rational numbers, we get the real numbers, and now we have a real number line, and on our real number line it is complete and there are no holes. So I could say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right in here is 3.142, uh, there's a pi number in here. And right here happens to be pi plus 1. And so those numbers weren't on this number line until we added the irrational numbers. It's pretty cool stuff. This concludes our section 4.4 uh, video. Thank you guys for listening, and bye now.